so basically, I, I can say, as you can see on the slide, my name is Daniel. I would like to tell you something about complex event processing, uh, especially uh, for the purpose of the fraud, process, fraud detection in the gambling domain. Uh, as you can see, the description in, in the brief of the talk was a little bit vagu and, and uh, uh, dodgy. Uh, this is because of that. I don't know if you know the uh, Polish regulation uh, as act of games and mutual wagering, especially Article 29, which says that promotion of gambling in any form uh, is uh, illegal and may cause the uh, um, may result in penalty fines or freedom restriction. So I don't know how many of you do know the uh, confession bear, latest uh, uh, hit of the internet. I would like to officially make a statement that this talk is not a part of the promotion of the gambling. And I personally, I'm disgusted with any form of gambling at all. I, I cannot even work in the gambling industry if I could. Uh, so. Uh, to, the, to the point of the presentation, uh, something egoistic, uh, as, as Chet Chef uh, told in, in his key talk about me, uh, I'm professionally working uh, as a software architect, also a programmer in the Novomatic. Novomatic is uh, a leading um, uh, gambling uh, system supplier in the Europe. Um, in my day-to-day -day job, I'm trying to do two things. First, I'm trying to simplify complex things to make the uh, clients satisfied. And the second is uh, try to complicate uh, simple stuff to challenge and improve the uh, development of, the, of our teams. Um, after hours, I work as a university lecturer still for a few months at AGH. Uh, and uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Futurama and, uh, and Rick and Morty. So uh, those two guys here, uh, Rick Sanchez and Ber Bender Rodriguez, are something like my emo emotional heroes. Uh, OK, what was the, our latest activity um, in our development for the last year, uh, for the last months? Basically, uh, we were challenged to create a service that will be able to detect frauds taking into account that the data may came from various, uh, various nodes, like, like those may be EGMs, which may pet, uh, put a bad placement or caching operations, or some kind of error-related stuff, but also a third-party systems that, uh, um, that makes a deposit to the central wallets. All of these informations are often stored in uh, different data formats, uh, but uh, semantically means the same. Uh, it is uh, presented here uh, in such a form to uh, narrow the scope of the presentation because it will be divided in three parts. First part, it will be maybe a little bit boring because it will be not so technical. It's something like a very quick introduction to the gambling domain so that you will understand, understand why it is so hard to deploy so cutting edge and novelty technologies. Uh, the second part will uh, tackle the aspect of the actual use case which triggered the further development of this service I will uh, tell you about. And the third one, uh, hopefully we'll get time uh, finalize it with the demo, will tackle the aspects of complex event processing pipelines, especially with the Esper complex processing engine, but also I will show some uh, integration with the Kafka as a um, uh, as uh, our messaging middleware. So, chapter one, called Legacies and Regulations are old kings of the hill. The gambling domain um, is very, uh, how to say it? The, the gambling domain is, uh, has a lot of legacies in here. Uh, because imagine the deployment of the systems that were done 20, 25 years ago, which caused that, okay, our gaming terminals are now connected, they are functioning, there is no any fancy features that can be deployed. These terminals are working. They are bringing the, the, the money to the operator. So what you would like, what, what, why you would like to change it? Why you would like to introduce some new features? And the second part is that even if we would like to do it, 
we cannot do it so easily because it costs. There is not only a cost of the development of the testing, but also the cost of all of the regulatory aspects that we have to certify every software that is placed on the market so there are no uh, intentionally, in, intentionally placed uh, any a mechanism that could uh, result in, in cheating from the operator side. So basically, we have three types of the systems. I categorize them in, from the context of the location of the random number generator and also the characteristic of the bed settlement. So first one is the, are the slots. So are, how many of you have played the slots in Poland or ever? OK, we have one guy there. So I don't know if you know, but this is uh, now it's completely legal. You can go to the uh, shop uh, offered by the Totalizator Sportov and play legally, not in these uh, strange uh, boxes somewhere. Uh, so basically, slots are characterized in, characterized in such a way that the random number generator which decides whether you win or you have lost is located completely on the terminal. So it just reports the information about the, the games to the back office for the purpose of the reporting, and finally, at the end of the day, uh, specifying how much cash the operator have to pay uh, in the context of the tax to the Minister of Finance. Uh, the bad settlement is almost instant. So when you uh, when you press the button of the of the of the, of the bed, then you almost instantly get the result. Uh, of this game plan and whether you win or have, or, or have lost. The second, second type of the systems are the lotteries, when you have uh, typically centrally deployed RNG, which is uh, connecting all the terminals, and you have uh, instant or delayed bad settlements. So you can either buy a, a ticket for the lottery and the result will be um, realized later, or you can uh, buy a ticket in the lottery and get the information whether you have win or lost almost instantly. The third one, it's typical sports betting. Uh, it shouldn't have the random number generator because it's based on, uh, on, on physical gameplay, something like uh, betting on Wisla uh, and, and Krakowia. I don't know if you, who, who are the fans of which teams. Uh, I like volleyball, so. Uh, and, and the bet settlement is quite long. Uh, and also what I have said is, is completely not true because the operators are very, um, very lucrative in, in, in what they have done. So basically they have introduced something called a virtual sports betting when you can bet on a virtual gameplay like a match uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is taking one minute and the result of this match is is, uh, is uh, using the RNG. So those are the types of the system that are uh, feeding uh, our service. Next, uh, we have two types of markets. First types of markets are non-regulated markets. Those markets are specified by such characteristic that uh, basically the Ministry of Finance or the regulator of a given country do not give any special regulations. You can do whatever you want if you are an operator. Requirements come di came directly from the operator, so basically he is the most, uh, uh, he is the, the biggest stakeholder here. And uh, the third, po here, third point is that you can introduce bug fixes to your software quite, um, uh, quite fast. So basically if you uh, fix something, you can talk to the operator and, and tell him, okay, I have fixed that, here are the ter there are the test results, let's place it on the market. The second part of the market are the second part of the markets are the regulated markets. Those are the markets when the Minister of Finance or the government are uh, supervisory to the uh, are supervising all the uh, characteristics of the system. So typically, your system when you deploy your, your your software have to communicate and, for example, wait for the acceptance of a given bet uh, from the uh, Ministry of Finance gateway. Uh, second, they introduce uh, some of the requirements in the context of the fraud detection, uh, and the third aspect is that they uh, uh, introduce something like a li licensing. You, if, you want, if you would like to provide uh, a system in the context of the regulated uh, market, you have to acquire a license. So you have to go to the, to the ministry, you have to show them your source code, they will sit with your teammates uh, on your source code, analyze it line by line, and accepting whether these specific uh, source files can be compiled using the, something called supervised build and placed on the market. 
And if you introduce some nasty bug, imagine what happened. There is no possibility to do something like a quick fix or deploy it somewhere uh, to, to make the market or uh, something like working again. No, you have to deal with it uh, and uh, you have to wait uh, a time that uh, will take for the regulator to analyze your changes. Of course, there are various of, uh, possibilities to, to speed it up, but uh, it's not, uh, <laughs> no, no, never right. <laughs> Then, okay, and uh, going to the frauds, finally. So basically, typically when we are talking about the frauds, um, everyone is thinking, okay, I lost my card, some ca someone can take that card or copy it and use it in the China or the USA. Th th those are the most typical frauds that um, uh, are, are perceived by the, pe by the people. In the context of the gambling, uh, we characterize five types of the frauds. Uh, First one is uh, physical cash box tampering. This is a relatively simple one. When you buy a crowbar, you go to the gaming terminal and you try to take the cash box from the terminal. It's extremely hard to prevent it from the software side, uh, as you imagine, but uh, we will see. Uh, the second type of the frauds is called multiple coin or note caching. So when you somehow try to make the terminal accept more money, from a single note or coin than it should. So typically when you place a money in the terminal, uh, it should be taken in and, uh, and a specific amount that you have cashed in uh, have to be uh, added to your balance. There are ways, uh, there, probably there are ways to, to cheat it. And uh, I will tell you in the next chapter how we provided the mechanism that can detect such scenarios. The third, third type of fraud is parallel identity usage. It means that if, for example, you are playing on the virtual lottery system, when you have a card, and this card, I don't know, it can be an NFC card, a barcode reader card that defines your identity, the first, the defines the, the account ID of your private uh, wallet uh, in the, in the uh, data center, if someone copy it, at some point, by, by some means, and try to use it on other terminal uh, in parallel, for example, to, to, the, to your gameplay, uh, this will be a fraud. The fourth type of the frauds are, are the geo geographically dispersed locations operations, and th those are the most typical frauds as in the case of the um, credit cards. So someone have steal your card and, and done some operation in a location that you couldn't be there at this specific moment. And the five, five, fifth type of the fraud is a typical cashless operations money laundering. So you have a lot of money that is coming from an illegal sources and you would like to wash it out. So to go to the casino, uh, play a little and take other money with similar amount to your home. So for example, you can then document uh, document that uh, uh, you have won it. And uh, those four, five types of the frauds uh, are our main general target to when we are designing our system. But how we get there? So, uh, chapter two. Chapter two is uh, telling about uh, how at uh, the end of the day we ended up that we need such a service. It all started with uh, software that uh, was devoted to gather the financial metrics from the gaming terminals. And uh, as you can see on, the, on, the, on, the, on this map, uh, it all started with a, a single thing and ended up uh, finally successfully, but uh, we create a little bit of a monster. Uh, and this is why we, the next time we try to do it uh, better. So the requirements for the purpose of this system was following. Basically, this was this, is, this one, one of the non-regulated par markets in one of the European Union countries, yet European Union countries. I can't tell you which European Union country, but they are still in the EU, uh, European Union. Approximately five to 6,000 of the gaming terminals connected to the system, uh, distributed across the whole country. And uh, the business wanted us to provide a tool that will be able to gather all information about the bets, all information about the errors, and visualize 
the KPIs. So basically, how many money this specific slot gaming terminal have earned, uh, or how many money this specific gaming terminal have lost in some kind of uh, time period or correlation between the locations or something like that, or how many money a specific game on the specific uh, on, a, on a given set of the gaming terminals have won. This was uh, something like six to seven years ago. So this slide is not completely true because at this time there were no bids at all in the ELK stack. So we thought some, uh, something like that. Okay, we, we need to gather some information from the terminals. We cannot touch them. They are certified, almost certified. So uh, the operator would not allow us to modify the, the gaming terminal to push out the data from them so that we can analyze it or some, some kind integrate. So basically, at the first step, we have written a simple script that was crawling the logs. Um, hopefully, in the logs, the guys from the gaming terminals uh, have uh, uh, placed the information about the meters. So a meters in the gaming terminal represents all the things that can be measured there. So the, those meters were, were written in a very simple form. One-liners, uh, approximately, 200, uh, 200 values, uh, which were the integers value, which represented whether there were some errors, how many games were played, and so on. And according to this definition, there is a 10 pages paper which specify what the specific uh, integer in this format means. So basically, we have placed this uh, uh, data collection string, uh, script on the gaming terminal. Then we have uh, um, placed in, in the log stash through the Kafka, as you will see soon. Then we have processed it, placed in the Laxip search, and visualized it through the Kibana. But the requirements started to narrow down. So basically, um, we have to think about the consistent data input uh, so that the messages will be uh, ordered, and if they uh, get to our back office, they cannot be lost. Then we uh, need to somehow separ separate um, uh, the, the whole processing pipelines into separate filer domains. So for example, if we got, I don't know, 3,000 messages in a given period, we cannot lose it. So if some kind of uh, processing logic is, is, break, is, bro is broken at some point, then we have to restart it and reprocess once more. Uh, of course, we needed the synchronous message processing and also the authentication authorization stuff here. Uh, um, and we have incrementally came to something like that. So basically, uh, we have utilized, uh, we utilized Kafka as our messaging middleware as a simple write ahead log. When we place a message on the Kafka, uh, despite whether it's from the terminals itself or some kind of the supported systems uh, which were necessary to also gather this information, uh, uh, we can process it in accordance to the logic uh, we can modify in the backend. So we, have a, so we had a set of the log slash instances that uh, simulated something like stream processing. Imagine how um, hard it was to uh, create something uh, that is not appropriate for the uh, final solution. But basically, we were successful. We have achieved something like that. We were able to provide the business uh, operation with uh, near real, near real time uh, data from um, uh, from the gaming terminals and uh, these dashboards which uh, uh, we have provided for them were more or less quite easily configurable so if they wanted to com correlate some information that, uh, for example, the producer of the terminal uh, is uh, uh, playing better or not, they could uh, do it here. At the end of the day, it showed up that uh, even the simple Lucene query language or Elastic query language is not so easy to use by the business people, even when they were semi-technical. So all of this stuff uh, had to be done by our guys. Uh, and 
we have done it. Uh, of course, there were a lot of problems with the data uh, because we have handled the data that was uh, sourced from different terminals. Sometimes there were data inconsistencies which we received, uh, but we fixed it. And the last part of this story is that uh, we are a few months working on the production. We have fixed all the critical and blockers that prevented us from the proper operation. Uh, and basically, we achieved a great success because the business had told, OK, we have increased our, our revenue by 5 to 10% because we are then able to modify the content on the terminals. So basically, they used the tool to gather information uh, what type of content can be placed on the terminal uh, to be more attractive. And then we get a mail, the mail that was saying, hey guys, it seems that uh, the bug that we have uh, two releases ago is uh, alive once more. So you screwed up, fix it uh, as soon as possible. Uh, at the beginning, no. Uh, software engineers, we create code, so we create bugs, as you can see from the keynote. So. Uh, we started to analyze. We started to analyze uh, everything we have. First, we started from the logstar processing uh, uh, logic. It was uh, uh, really hard because um, the team was not so big. Um, the legacy there was uh, uh, quite big, so we had to something, do something like a real-time analysis in the production environment. Uh, but we have uh, checked that, OK, Logstar is, is working correctly. There are no problems that the pipelines are, are, uh, are good. OK, so maybe we have screwed something up in the elastic. Uh, no, the elastic is also good. The indexes are, are proper. Everything, everything is fine. OK, so uh, obviously we have screwed up the, the dashboard so that they, they are not showing, uh, they are not showing uh, the, the data uh, in a form that they should. Um, finally, it's shown up. No, this is also good. So the only point that we didn't check was the gaming terminals. Like, uh, OK, so we have a problem with the incoming data. So we checked the logic. No, it, it's fine. It's, it's working as, uh, as expected. We didn't, didn't even change it in the last releases. Uh, so we had to find the, the source of these inconsistencies. Uh, at the end of the day, so something like a spoiler alert, we implemented a very nasty and custom mechanism that allowed to identify two types of the frauds. The one of them was multiple caching operations, and the second was money laundering detection. So how, how we done it? This is this uh, big and uh, ugly stuff that shouldn't be created, but it worked at the end of the day. So first, uh, we created, um, uh, for the purpose of the multiple caching operations, you know, placing the money into the terminal and taking the note out of it so that the terminal accepts it and you still have the money in your hand. And you do it a few times. It worked. Uh, supposedly, it worked. So uh, we implemented uh, uh, um, a, a custom Python script that crawled to the Elastic and checked whether there are subsequent events uh, that represents the caching on a specific uh, partitioned by terminal ID uh, in a given time period. This is, uh, I can show you this script after the presentation. How does it look like? It's nothing that should be presented there. It's, 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 it's bad, you know, uh, but <laughs> uh, it worked at the end of the day. Uh, and the second stuff was money laundering detection. So, that's, this one was uh, a little bit tricky. It required uh, for, from us to identify a pattern when the player came to the terminal, put the nodes, play two gameplays with a really low stake, and they tend to take the money out. So basically, uh, if uh, you have something like an illegally earned money and you would like to, to, to change it to a legal money, you could do it if someone do not have such, uh, uh, such mechanism. So uh, um, this one was uh, implemented as a Logstash plugin that created something like a session of the player for when, the, when there was a first caching operation on the gaming terminal. Uh, the the Logstash persist, uh, persisted this event as a session for a given terminal and then tracked how many gameplays were done uh, in a given time period, and when the session ended, when someone uh, placed um, K 
cache out on the terminal, uh, then triggered an alert. So we have implemented that. We have placed it on the market. And after, I think, two months, the, the guys from the business uh, have written uh, to the team a quite nice email like, hey, guys, your mechanisms are working. We have uh, catched the, the criminals. Now it's better. Uh, so that, that is something like a personal success. Yeah, we have done something that, that helped the world better, like help the operator earn more. Uh, so uh, that was good. But then we started to think, mm, OK, but uh, this is not the way we should do it. Uh, first of all, we have spent a lot of time to do it, uh, and uh, it's hard. So here is uh, how we came to chapter three. So complex event processing pipelines using Kafka streams and Esper. Uh, this one is really good. So this was something like we, we have felt, like, like our software have told to us, uh, make me better, make me not look like that. Uh, what we decided to use, so basically you remember this, uh, this, uh, this uh, slide from the beginning of the presentation. Uh, so basically the, the concept inside is extremely simple because I, I personally am I'm, I'm a very big fan of m lately making uh, things simpler because if they are complex, they, they are complex to explain to the client, they are complex to explain to the software team, the development team, and after two months, they are complex to others third, even for, for me. So if those things are not simple, then we have done something seriously wrong. So basically, uh, using the similar technology stack, uh, we started to migrate to other, uh, more appropriate um, approach to detect the frauds. Uh, Kafka is well known by everyone. Who knows Esper? Oh. One guy, <laughs> unfortunately, my colleague from the from the PhD. So, <laughs> hello, Marek. Um, okay, so um, you will see what it is. Uh, who know Kafka and Kafka streams? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, so Kafka streams are uh, bleh. Uh, they, those are not good stuff. Uh, I would not like to do uh, something like um, introduction to uh, KSQL and Kafka streams there. Because if you want to do it from the last year, DevOps Poland 2018, there's a great talk of Tim Berglund processing streaming data with KSQL. Uh, watch it. It will be much more better than, than Eric, I, I present. So this is the guy from the Confluent I.O. So uh, they are making everything better in the context of the Kafka. But basically, to introduce and to get the, more or less the same set of the, of the uh, knowledge, uh, Kafka is a typical write-ahead log, nothing more. Kafka streams are the tools that allows you to write a statements, SQL-like statements, that are able to process incoming data and put them in a different form on another Kafka topic. And you can do it in a streaming way, so you can subscribe for a constant update of those events. So using the Kafka streams, you can basically write your own event-driven uh, architecture and uh, modern systems, and then you will see that you don't know what's happening inside, because there are a lot of topics and the data is flowing and you are not monitoring it, uh, but you can try. Uh, so we tried a little bit, a uh, little bit different approach, uh, but very similar to Kafka Streams. So to use the dedicated engine devoted for the complex event processing uh, only for the complex event processing. And the complexity here is not about the complex structure of the events or the complexity of using it. It's about the complexity of uh, correlating and reasoning what can be done. So this is about the complex event processing, that we are trying to correlate events flowing from uh, multiple streams and detect patterns. Uh, basically, at the end of the day, it's all about windowing, grouping, and pattern detection. Nothing more. There is no magic there. If you only uh, are quite comprehend and understand how to define those patterns, then you specify them in a dedicated DSL, and you are done. Uh, and of course, everyone has to be uh, SQL-like uh, compliant, so 
uh, nevertheless, uh, Esper is also here. Uh, this is the high-level architecture from the um, Esper engine, uh, like uh, uh, stream processing uh, engine. It's a big, uh, big project, open source. You can take the Esper tech. Unfortunately, it's GPL. Fortunately, no, I, I'm a fan of open source and of free software also, so GPL is also cool. Uh, but basically, you specify uh, statements that represent your logic of processing the streams, and you get an update. If you make those statements complex, they will be complex. Uh, so going through the processing model of this complex event processing, the easiest and the most uh, hello world-like statements are select everything from stream uh, called withdrawal. So if you only send an event to that stream, then you will get, as a consumer of that stream, every update on every new event received with all the data associated. This is quite easy. Then you can aggregate the stuff. So basically, you don't need to write a code to uh, do some aggregation sums or some mathematical fancy operation, you have a lot of existing operators. OK, counting maybe is not so big, but sum also. Uh, OK, but you can compute the, the coefficients or something like that. But basically, if you write something like that, the internal of the engine is doing the aggregation for you. So, so registering such a statement will give you following results. If you get an event with an uh, amount of uh, 500 of something, uh, you will get an update that you got one event and, uh, and the sum is 500. If you get a second event uh, with 100, you will get an update, OK, we have two events in the stream and the sum is uh, 600. And uh, this will follow. But uh, not limiting this, Cause that you will get something like a very simple uh, computational logic that is uh, not so fancy there. So you can, of course, filter all the stuff using the properties that are passed in these events. The properties are either JSON fields, either fields of the plain old Java objects, or any other binary, uh, binary message that is supported here. So basically, you can write your statement and filter through some kind of the properties, the behavior will be quite understandable. Uh, it gets more, com more complicated, so you can filter and aggregate. So apply the filter and aggregate only those that uh, came out from this filtering information. Uh, but the most funny and most interesting part uh, starts when you are talking about windowing or uh, pattern recognition. So the windowing is nothing more like specifying, OK, I'm interested in a uh, slider windows, for example, which means that I would like to have those aggregations or those sums only for the last f n events. Uh, in the sample here, uh, you will see that this uh, event length is 5. So basically, to, uh, at the time of the working of the system, if you get a new information, uh, you will get information about only the last five events. There is a uh, back in the documentation of Esper, you will get uh, information about all the events here. So you are not uh, forsaken like you have to store it somewhere. It, it will give you. And the other type of the events are the time-based windows. So basically, you can specify, I would like to get all the events uh, which were caught by, for example, the last n seconds. And this, the processing model, will look something like that. If we get more events there, we will get the updates. This is still also quite understandable. There is nothing more. Uh, but the funny part begins here. So in the context of fraud detection, it's all about patterns. Patterns of events that came from the external systems or user activity. So uh, if you have only the features, uh, the capabilities to specify the, those patterns, then you can try to define the policies that will represent your fraud detection logic. So here, uh, this particular solution allows you to define the patterns uh, using following meta language. You can order the sequentiality of the events using this, uh, this uh, how is this in English? Uh, uh, arrow, right arrow. Uh, so uh, here the left predicate is followed by the uh, right predicate. You can also correlate 
the events that are uh, that, that are defined in this statement, and for example, do something like joins. This is similar to the joins in the SQL. So here, I would like to get a notification every time when the event X is uh, before the event from the event stream, event Y, and the correlation ID of my second event is the same as the correlation ID of my first event. So here is a typical example how to try to join two types of events from two different streams. And the example actually from the single, uh, single event stream is the following. So I, want, I would like to get notification when there are two cache out operations, one after the other, both with the amount of cash uh, um, uh, higher than 400 pounds, and the second event arrived at least 10 minutes after the first one. So if someone here will be making a cash out, this is, this is not fraud detection rule, but to, exit, to make it uh, something like uh, more concrete, if someone ma is making a cash out so with a value bigger than 400 pounds, so then the engine starts to create something like a context. If, if we get another cache out after that one within a time, uh, um, a time window of 10 minutes, we will get a notification. And more, uh, uh, more uh, informative uh, stuff is to also partition by something. Of course, in, 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 the, in the stream processing principle, uh, you are not creating a stream per entity. So for example, if you have uh, 5,000 5, of users, we would not divide our architecture into 5,000 of streams, because then if we get a new user, we would have to create a new stream. So basically, you are creating something like a user activity stream. We have a field user ID, and then from these uh, streams, we are trying to process it. So this, this uh, statement is used to do exactly uh, something like that, to create an inner partitions uh, in our stream, where here we specify by which the partition have to be made. Uh, and this actual, one of the actual statements that we are using is looking like that. So from the created context called segmented by machine ID, which partition all the events by machine ID, so we have internally uh, a collection of the event stream partitioned by, um, by uh, each of the machines, we are trying to find the, the pattern like that. OK, so those are the examples. And now I would like to show you how the real case uh, real case uh, um, pattern recognition statements looks in our uh, our system. So it looks something like that. I will address three of them to show you more or less what are the capabilities, and then I will show you the fancy simulator that I have written yesterday, uh, fancy, uh, to demo something that uh, will prove that uh, that is true. So basically. We are talking about the physical cash box tampering. Actually, I, I have told uh, previously that we are limited there. We cannot uh, identify something that uh, someone is trying to destroy the terminal with the cash uh, with the crowbar. Uh, actually, we are. Uh, in every gaming terminal, we have uh, something called sensor. So there is a sensor for the doors. There is a sensor uh, for for the cash boxes and something like that. Typically, the business have told us that if someone is trying to break the terminal using the crowbar, those sensors are flickering. So we get an information on off, on off, on off. So this statement is uh, something like a heuristic and tell, OK, if I get a three subsequent uh, pairs of event that uh, represents the flickering of the sensor, so this is a coloration of the sensor from the stream, then give me an alert. So basically, if we will have, in a, within a three seconds, repeatance of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of, of this three, uh, two pairs uh, of this uh, pair of the, of the events, a uh, fraud alert will be generated. Uh, next, we have the multiple coin and node caching uh, fraud detection mechanism. Similarly, we are partitioning by machine ID from our caching event stream. Then we are creating a pattern that will match every caching event that is 
followed by the caching event with the same amount, and that is finally followed by the, by the third event from the, with the same caching amount. This is uh, not our work. The guys from the operation have told us, typically guys are trying to do it three times. And so they're trying to do it twice, and then the, uh, then the third time they leave the banknote inside so that no one is suspicious. But uh, we have to detect whether, for example, uh, because we have to limit it. So this is a contrary argument that check whether between those three events uh, of, of subsequent cashings with the same amounts, we did not receive a bad placement event. So basically, this will trigger a fraud alert only if we have a situation that someone is trying to do a caching event, followed by caching event, followed by caching event, and in between of them, there is no bad placement event. Uh, as I said, this is a heuristic, so it will not work. Now you can go to the one of the European markets and try to cheat. Uh, and the third one, showing the, the, a little bit uh, another point of view, it's parallel identity usage. So basically, we are trying from our bed placement event stream, partition the, uh, all of the information about betting in a given account ID and check whether there is uh, information that two subsequent bet placement events happened for the same account ID from different location. So this is a simplified form of this because location typically in our case is a big fat JSON which describes a lot of stuff. Uh, and if it happened with one minute, five, ten minutes, uh, the rule here should be much more uh, intelligent, uh, then an alert will be generated. Uh, and uh, to not uh, do something like only talking and talking and talking, which I like, I would like to demo it and hope it will work. It should. Um, okay. So here is, uh, okay, you see nothing. So wait a moment. I will just increase the, the font. Okay. Font to 34. Okay, it can be. Uh, so basically, here I started uh, a typical single note uh, Kafka broker. It will be needed for a further part of the, of the demo. And I need to start the idea. Okay, the, the code will be old and nasty because I have done it yesterday, and yesterday was uh, Father Day, something like that in English, so uh, I didn't have too much time, but it should work. Uh, so let's see. Okay, so maybe I will change the to, to uh, the same uh, the same uh, display as to one display. Give me a moment. This will be easier for me. Okay. Now you should see the same as me. Not this slide. Uh, okay, one moment. Uh, increase font size. Uh, okay. So basically, this is a typical Spring Boot application generated with Spring Initializer. Uh, what I have done here uh, is uh, as my entry point, I created a bin called Esper Test Runtime Initializer, which is doing nothing more that is initializing. Uh, okay, um, I don't know how strong. Okay, wait a moment. OK. 
okay. Oh, I like it. I love it. Alt tilde. No. Color scheme. Ah, oh, yeah. Default. Okay. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, so basically, uh, I will leave the presentation mode also. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. More? Now it's good? Okay, so basically uh, what I'm doing here, I'm initializing the configuration. The configuration of this specific engine is... <sighs> Wait a moment. I have a mouse, it's faster. I have turned on the scrolling, the zoom. I had a mouse. Yeah, I had a mouse. So, no. We have to live with it. I have to live with it. Uh, so, as here, you can see that uh, I'm registering the schema of the streams. And here, my, my, my streams are nothing more like uh, plain old Java objects, so a typical Pojos that contains a few of the properties. Uh, then, uh, using this, uh, this provided the, sorry, using this provided runtime, I'm initializing it, and I'm registering uh, a set of the statements as were shown in the, uh, in the demo session. So basically, that will, uh, they will uh, get a notification about all the, uh, all the updates here. And the last part is that I have written a very fancy uh, user, uh, user input uh, simulator that in case of receiving a number one to three, it's sending the caching event with an amount one to three. Uh, in case of sending, uh, uh, of uh, pressing a button six to seven, it's, uh, it's doing the bad placement, and in case of pressing the zero, it's generating the sensor flickering. So basically, if I do something like that, you should see here that uh, sending cache an event, uh, and the event was sent. One of our statement was uh, telling that if we have three subsequent events of the same type, we will get an information notification about that. So here is what we get. We get an information that, okay, uh, a pattern has been matched. All the events that were here uh, are, are, uh, are shown, and some Kafka stuff I will uh, uh, in the, tell it uh, in, a, in a two minutes. So basically, if I do something like a cache in one, two, one, two, I will not get a fraud or something like that. Uh, on the other hand, we had a statement that was telling whether there are two bad placements from different locations, uh, we should uh, generate a, a fraud alert. So the six is generating a bad placement from the Krakow, some, somewhere from here, and the seven is generating a bad placement from the Warsaw. This is a very simple simulator to show that these patterns are working. And the last thing is that uh, we can generate a flickering of the sensors, uh, and if you analyze the content of these events, it will only uh, generate if I do it three times in a period of three seconds. So here we got an information what events generated this, uh, this data. But as I have said uh, at the beginning, uh, putting every information into the complex event processing e e engine uh, is not the, what we want to achieve. We wanted to achieve that if we get a fraud, we want to, uh, uh, something like a control loop and to place the information somewhere, somewhere back, for example, in Kafka. So I could write either uh, my nasty code to, to handle the Kafka client or, or, or I could use the predefined 
configuration for something called Kafka Output Adapter for this engine, and all the patterns that are tagged that they should be outputted to the Kafka will be done. So basically, if you see once more, there is an information that the caching pattern has been matched, and the proper uh, event was sent to the Kafka, because in our code, we have specified that this specific multiple caching patterns should be outputted to the Kafka. All of the stuff with configuration, it's, it's, it's not the magic stuff. It's also here. It's just presented in, in something like that. So we have those fraud alerts here. And uh, if uh, I didn't screw up anything, if I will do something like that, OK. To go. Wait a moment. Split to the right. Uh, so this is our cluster of Kafka. And here we should have OK. Uh, Docker compose exec Kafka bin. Uh, is that, if I remember correctly, we should compose, uh, we should exec into the container. Um, in the, uh, that hosts the Kafka, so that we will get the uh, command line tools responsible for that, but we will see. Uh, yeah, but this is Docker Compose. It has a slightly different, uh, we are here, so we are going the, to the Kafka instance, and I will show you that those messages uh, are, are, are getting there. And okay, we have this bin. And, and here we have, uh, it's called Kafka, Kafka console, consumer, minus, minus, bootstrap, server, localhost, 1992, minus, minus, topic, route alerts. Okay, I was, ooh. Okay, and one more thing I didn't show from the beginning. So I will once more use our uh, fancy simulator to generate a fraud. And voila, it's here. So basically, of course, it's nasty and it's very raw. So typically, we should define a separate stream called uh, machine caching events, frauds, and then maybe enrich them with some other information when this happened, who, who have done it, and, and so on. But more or less, it show how it should be done. And going back to the presentation, that was my last slide. I am out of time. So thanks for being here, and uh, I would appreciate uh, your question if there are any. Yes? Once more? Of this engine. OK, so uh, there are two points here. Um, this engine is open source. It's available under GPL. Uh, the, the, the company that is trying to, to provide the bandwidth uh, is telling uh, bandwidth, bandwidth information and performance tests is telling that it's eff uh, very efficient because all of their statements are compiled into the byte code. Byte code. So it is uh, uh, not processed uh, using something like a pattern on regexp. Uh, stuff, but uh, represented as uh, something like an uh, abstract syntax tree of the, the objects that uh, represents those statements that we register here. So I was without the problem, I was uh, able to process something like a few hundred events per second on my laptop with doing more complex stuff. But uh, the main problem is that the, there is something like a HA and highly scalable setup of this, also using the Kafka, but it is paid. Uh, but it's quite easy to do it on your own. If, for example, you can partition the streams on the Kafka and place to the, to the underlying engines something like a sharding, only the information that is necessary uh, for, for our specific cases, it should be easy. But it is told to be very efficient. Yep. Uh, so the 
Okay, so the question is whether uh, I have done any comp we have done uh, the comparison uh, in AWS uh, stream processor. Short answer, no. <laughs> but uh, in general, um, there is uh, uh, a few solutions that uh, can be used here. Something similar, but a little bit different is uh, rules. Red Hat rules, you know, the guys here. Uh, this is a reasoning engine, so it is capable of doing the same stuff. You can do it, but uh, with a little bit uh, different approach. Uh, the point is that this solution that I have told you, it's quite long, uh, quite old. So it's not a new player on the market. It's here from the 2006, I think. So uh, when I have heard that Kafka Streams was announced in 2016, uh, I have smiled and told, okay, now you have to be, be more mature to get the, to the level that you will be able to represent this pattern recognition. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yes. Uh, so, uh, exactly as you have asked, uh, we are planning to, to put the first part of the processing to Kafka Streams. Basically, to normalize the data, to make sure that all of the streams coming from multiple tenants that can fit our system are represented in the same form. And here, in these blocks, do only the processing that can be expressed uh, in, in such a form. Because you can also write off all of this logic, processing logic from Java code. But it's not the, the way we would like to go. We would like to have it clear because what's important, we have to show the regulator that this piece of software is doing exactly that. And the semi-technical guys understand the SQL. So we will be a little bit uh, easier there. No? <laughs> OK, so if there is no question, uh, Thanks one more, and uh, feel free to ask me uh, whenever you want uh, in the context of complex event processing for frauds. Thank you. <laughs>